Hi, I'm Bill Ackman, CEO of Pershing Square Capital Management, and today we're going to talk about ADP. We're going to talk about the proxy contest we're running to put a few people on the board of the company, three, including myself. I'm going to walk you through a presentation, probably take us about 30 minutes. We're going to walk through some of the key issues facing the company, and I'm going to give you a chance to ask questions. And during the presentation, at any time, you can email us a question. Uh, you email the question to, and we'll, we'll, we'll show you in a moment, uh, ADP ascend, ascending at persq.com, and we'll show you the email. Why don't I begin with the presentation? Um, so first, just a brief intro on Pershing Square. Uh, we are a very concentrated investor. Uh, we invest our capital in a handful of investments. ADP represents about 25% of our capital, so it's our largest investment today. We've got a good track record for investing capital. Uh, we invest in uh, businesses where we think there's enormous potential, where the potential has been unrealized, and we can help realize that potential. If you look at our track record for these kind of investments, we've done quite well. The average return on an investment where we've bought more than 5% of the company and pushed for change, a so-called 13D investment, has been 145% versus the S&P, which earned about a 16% return over the same period. And we're a long-term investor. We tend to own stocks for four to six years, and we're here to in this case, help ADP achieve its full potential. We've got about a $2.6 billion investment in the company. And really the question is, why are we reaching out to you? And here we're doing a call at 7 o'clock at night to accommodate investors, individual investors who are at home, had a chance to have some dinner, and want to hear the story about ADP. Now, why you? 28% uh, of ADP is owned by retail investors. Individual investors, perhaps like yourself, uh, investors who may have a relatively small amount of shares in the context of the size of the company, and who think their vote may not be important. And one of the most important rights you have as a shareholder is the right to elect the board of directors. And to give you a sense of how important your vote is, uh, just today, Procter & Gamble uh, announced the results uh, of a proxy contest between an activist shareholder, and the activists got something slightly less than a majority. I'm told the margin was less than 1% of the shares outstanding. So even a few shares can make a big difference in this election. And we want you to make a decision uh, based on the facts, uh, and you decide who you want to represent you on the board of directors of the company. I'm going to walk you through uh, some more uh, slides. So let me tell you about why we invested in the company. This is a great business, and it's been a great business over a very long period of time. But unfortunately, like many great businesses that have done well over long periods, eventually the business uh, sometimes becomes complacent. And often that happens after the owner is no longer there. This is a company founded by uh, the Taub family, a man by the name of Henry Taub, an accountant, helped build this company and make it into a great business. At a certain point in time, he stepped off the board, he retired, and sadly he passed away. And the family no longer owns a material interest in the company. Uh, the board has been represented by professional directors, and these are all you know, good human beings, but they don't have nearly the same kind of interest that a major owner has in the boardroom. Uh, here are the directors uh, of the 10. Only one has bought stock in the last 14 years, and none of them have reached into their own pocket other than one director who bought 1,000 shares 13 years ago. Uh, by comparison, we've invested $2.6 billion in the company. Obviously, we care enormously about how the business does. And the case here uh, is relatively straightforward. Uh, it's a great business, but it's underperformed its potential. We think that potential can be uh, dramatically improved and realized, and we can fix the problems without increasing the risk of the company. And if you do that, that will accelerate uh, the growth of the company. It will accelerate and increase the profitability of the business. It will allow the company to pay uh, bigger dividends and investors will be rewarded uh, for years uh, to come. Just a brief overview, because you may have many stocks in your portfolio, I'm going to just describe how we think about ADP. ADP is comprised of three different businesses, as we think about it. Uh, the core business that people think about is the so-called employer services part of ADP. And this is the part of the business where ADP provides payroll services and all kinds of other what are called human capital management uh, services uh, for businesses. So all the services that a a company uses to manage its relationship with employees, to help it recruit employees, to help it manage uh, retirement plans for employees, health care benefits, uh, workman's comp, uh, all the various issues, uh, time and attendance products so that uh, businesses that have a lot of hourly uh, workers, can, they can manage those uh, relationships. It's a very good business. It's a business with significant growth as companies have realized that managing the relationship with their employees is an absolutely mission critical a function. This business is about 87% of the revenues of the company, uh, but only about two-thirds of the profits. And we'll explain why it's a smaller percentage of the profits uh, than the revenues. And that is, we think the opportunity here is for much larger margins. The company has a business called the Professional Employer Organization Business. And we like this business a lot. We think it's run well. But we think it also has a much greater opportunity for growth. A PEO, uh, by another name, is a way to outsource, if you're a small company, 
the, all these human resource services to ADP, and they handle everything from payroll uh, to managing, helping manage your relationship with employees. So a small company with, let's say, 50 employees doesn't have to hire a large team of uh, HR professionals and can get the benefits of the group buying power of, of ADP's you know, uh, 10,000 different uh, PEO uh, customers and perhaps the 500,000 or so underlying employees who they're buying health care insurance for and negotiating favorable rates. And the last piece of ADP's business is what we call the client fund, or ADP calls the client fund interest business. And this is the float uh, that ADP gets when you, a company wires ADP some money to pay its payroll, to pay the taxes to the government. ADP holds onto that money for a very short period of time, but even a day and a half on something approaching $2 trillion adds up to $23 billion of average funds or float that the company can invest and earn a return. Now, the company invests that money very safely. We think they, it's critically important they continue to do so. Um, and they're earning a relatively modest 1.7% return on those funds. Now, the good news is, as rates rise, uh, the yield will go up. So we like the float business, if you call it that. We think the PEO business is well positioned, but could grow more quickly. We're going to focus our attention on the employer services company. Uh, part of the business. So just briefly here, uh, you can be able to print out these slides at home and look at them more carefully, but ADP really competes in four different segments. The small uh, business, the middle market business, what they call enterprise, or these are companies with a thousand or more employees, and the international and multinational companies. ADP is in a strong position, we think, with respect to smaller companies, with respect to mid-market companies, with respect to international, multinational companies, and has struggled in the enterprise part of the business as competitors have emerged uh, with better products, uh, better service offerings, and that's taken market share away from ADP. And this is one of the reasons why the company's growth has slowed. So the ADP is very exposed in the national account part of their business. And companies like Workday, companies like Ultimate Software have really eaten ADP's lunch in this part of their business. This is one of the things that we'd like to fix. Um, and it's underperformed its potential. And how do you see that? Well, one way to take a look at that is to look at the performance of the company. How much revenue does each employee generate? And here we line up all of ADP's competitors. And what's interesting is every one of ADP's competitors, other than a couple of tiny competitors, Paycom and Paylocity, have much higher revenue per employee. And this is kind of a simple way to look at the productivity of a business. Now, in light of ADP's scale, it should have much, much higher uh, productivity. Uh, it just should be a more efficient business. Um, but in fact, the opposite is the case. ADP generates something in order of $160,000 per employee. The competitors average 223%. And the company has not been willing to answer the question of why their productivity is 28% less than its competitors. If you take a look at Paychex, which is one of the few really scaled competitors, larger companies that competes with ADP, Paychex competes with ADP in about 30% of ADP's revenues, kind of the small customer up until the, the kind of small mid-sized business that compete directly with, a, with ADP. <clears throat> What's interesting here is their productivity, as I mentioned before. You know, their amount of revenue per employee is meaningfully greater. And then if you take a look at their profitability, their margins, they've got 19%. We have 19% margins at ADP. They've got more than twice that, uh, 41% uh, in their business. So twice the profitability from a margin perspective uh, and much higher productivity per employee. And the question is why? And Jim Cramer, the well-known CNBC host, asked, this was just a couple days ago, asking the CEO, you know, Marty, I was looking at your margins versus the margins of automatic data, ADP, which does large clients. I noticed your margins are appreciably better. And his answer was, and this is the CEO of Paychex, you know, the margins are strong because we keep expense out of the business. We've never really let it in. Few layers of management. We really make sure our process is very tight as far as how fast we can onboard clients and then service them. We started seven or eight years ago, realizing that we had to invest a lot more in technology. We reduced our costs on the operations side, and we invested all those dollars in technology. And we think the same opportunity applies at ADP. Unfortunately, they were neck and neck seven years ago. If you take a look at this chart, if you see that line, which is sort of mid-2011, Paychex revenue per employee was about the same as ADP. And they started being smarter about the way they use technology. They took out layers in the business. They focused on controlling their expenses and their productivity improved uh, dramatically. And you can see the comparison. They were neck and neck in 2009. And by 2017, a huge gap emerged in terms of the company's productivity. How do we know that other than this very simple metric that the company is not run efficiently? One way is to take a look at a company's real estate portfolio. This is a map of the country, obviously. We've got 100 
and 30, mil, 30 locations comprising 10 million square feet of real estate. These are like the two towers of the World Trade Center spread all across the country. Very hard to run a business that's in 130 different locations. And this is a vestige of the way the business was run many years ago when people would literally deliver a magnetic tape with uh, a list of uh, payroll uh, that needs to be paid to their employees. Checks would be cut, uh, would be driven back to the companies that could be distributed to employees. And it's this legacy that is um, you know, one of the problems of the company because they're still running a business. You know, they might have 80, 100 people in an office. Each office has to have security, reception. You know, think about how inefficient that is. Another good indication, another way to get a sense of a business is take a look at uh, kind of the corporate headquarters. And here you have uh, multiple critical businesses spread uh, you know, seven plus miles apart uh, in, New in New Jersey where their the main headquarters are located. So you've got the corporate headquarters and then the small business, you've got to get into your car and drive 20 minutes. And then when you get to major accounts, you've got to drive another six miles. And then if you want to work with the folks in the PEO business, now the, the small, uh, small businesses are the target customer for the PEO. So what ADP should be doing is the, the PEO business, which is much more profitable and generates much more revenue per employee, should be winning as many accounts as possible from small business. It's kind of hard to do that when it's based down in southern Florida and the S&P business is based in New Jersey. And by the way, the national account business, you know, it's in Atlanta. And then you know, other elements of the business, again, spread throughout the company. And this is a very good indication of inefficiency. And this affects the company's ability not just to keep their costs under control, but it affects their ability to compete and grow. And that's best evidenced by growth. And if you take a look at uh, this business was growing at 6 or 7% pretty consistently for five or six years. 2017, uh, growth dropped from 6% to 4%. The company's projections are 2 to 3% for next year. And then magically, they're projecting a very, very large bump to 7 to 9% growth for fiscal years 2019 and 2020. And we hope that happens. Um, but certainly, the, the chart or the graph is not uh, headed in the right direction. And part of this, we think, is the inefficiency of the company, uh, some of the way that incentives are designed in the business. And these are the kinds of things as a, as a director and our directors would like to fix. So why do we believe this business can be substantially improved? Uh, the answer is, uh, there's the, what's needed here is basic blocking and tackling. How do we run a business in the most efficient manner? So one, we think there are many, way too many layers of management. There are 11 or 12 layers between the CEO and the lowest ranking employee. And that's just, today, that's not an efficient business. Paychex has, we believe, approximately five layers between the CEO and the lowest ranking employee. Each of these businesses, small, medium, national accounts, international, they run as completely separate businesses. This is almost a conglomerate with totally different business units. Uh, each of them have their own services and probably their own HR departments and their own finance departments and their own uh, sales teams and their own implementation teams. And you know, what's interesting here is that companies run like a conglomerate, but all these businesses are the same. The only difference between them is some serve small companies, some serve large, some serve large businesses. It's not, we think, an efficient rate to run the business. And then you look at the real estate portfolio and how inefficient that is. And then the support organization. There are tens of thousands of employees that are serving customers. And a big part of that is the products aren't designed so that the users can solve their own problems. And today, people don't want to pick up the phone and wait online to be helped by a customer service representative to learn how to use a product that should be intuitive and easy to use. And then just implementation. When you bring on a new client, it's a very manual process at ADP. There are multiple company employees involved in that process, uh, and it's very inefficient. Many of ADP's competitors have designed much more automated systems to bring customers online, and that has enabled them to operate in a more efficient manner. Uh, the technology, uh, technology has never been a strong suit for ADP. Uh, they've got an enormous technology department. They're spending $840 million a year. Uh, they've got 9,000 people. Uh, 900 of which are in innovation labs. Um, but we're not seeing a huge amount of innovation out of ADP, and we're not seeing uh, best-in-class products out of the company. And this, of course, leads to below, uh, gro you know, growth below the levels that we would like uh, to see. And each of these opportunities are things that we think we can help if we join this board. And importantly, management admits the problem. Uh, you look in uh, 2013, uh, the CEO, Carlos Rodriguez, asked a question about the company's margins. He says, when you look at ADP's overall pre-tax operating margin, it's pretty darn good. But when I stack it up against other companies that are in similar industries to us, I think there is plenty of room there. He's talking about the opportunity to improve margins. He says, so we have one or two competitors that have higher operating margins than we do, paychecks, for example. That would be a good example of how much space 
how much room there is. Again, paychecks at 40% margins, ADP at 19% margins. We think management needs to be held accountable for that opportunity. Since we launched our campaign, a number of analysts have come out and supported the opportunity that we've identified. I'm just going to briefly read uh, some quotes from analysts in the community. From Deutsche Bank, Brian Keene, he says, we agree there are significant margin expansion opportunities and expect the activist involvement to potentially help drive greater focus on improving the employer services margins going forward. Lisa, Bernstein, Lisa Ellis at Bernstein, we believe there's likely a valid case for accelerated margin expansion at ADP. There is merit in Pershing challenging the rate and pace at which ADP is driving efficiency and service delivery and addressing its legacy platforms. There is a 10 to 15 percentage point delta difference between ADP and competitor margins, which cannot be easily explained by structural differences. ADP's business is more labor intensive than peers, and examples exist of successful margin expansion after spinning out of ADP. And what she's referring to there is a business called Dealer Services that was inside of ADP, and you may own this stock because it was spun to you. You got a stock certificate in the mail. And this company, since it came out of ADP, has massively improved its margins up over 70% in just three years. Again, uh, Mark, uh, Mark Kahn from Baird, we agreed with many of the points highlighted by Pershing. There's an opportunity to further improve margins. ADP's revenue per employee lacks competitors, reflecting multiple platforms and redundant service centers. And then Ashwin uh, Shrivakar from Citi, Pershing Square did break out a number of analytically sound points that can add up to a sizable benefit. ADP has been managed for risk averse, multi-year gain. It is appropriate to ask these tough questions and expect an answer on the likelihood of setting an aggressive target and trying to deliver it. And we've asked these questions. We've asked a question each week to ADP, none of which have been responded to. But let's hear from Jim Cramer. Uh, I had an opportunity to speak to Jim on his show. Uh, the following morning, he was on uh, CNBC, uh, I think Squawk Box in the morning. The man is very rigorous. He does quality work. I think he argues a good point. I think that automatic data has been complacent. I think that this has lit a fire under them and will probably help them. But the fact is, is that many of the points that he makes in this new, uh, just uh, totally uh, devoid of any sort of fire Ackman are right. I, I think he should. I think he deserves a board seat. I think he could help the company. Uh, so those are Jim's thoughts, and uh, we think he's a, been a very thoughtful uh, analyst for years. Um, now, the stock is up a lot uh, in the last month, and the question is why. Uh, analysts uh, say, well, we get asked all the time how much of Ackman is in the stock. We'd expect the stock would probably be trading down around 100 if Pershing had not gotten involved. That's Lisa Ellis from Bernstein. Uh, David Grossman from Stifel said 94 to 100 based on their typical multiple to the premium multiple to the S&P. &P. And then again, Citi, prior to the recent developments between ADP and activist investor Bill Ackman, many investors believed in a $95 to $100 outcome for ADP, as did we with our prior $98 target. Now, the stock today closed a little above 114 versus the unaffected price of about 97. So it's up you know, nicely. Uh, why? Because people are beginning to bet that if we join this board, that we can help the company be successful and become much more profitable. And if we can do that, shareholders can make a lot more money. Uh, the company can become a lot more profitable. It can pay more dividends. It can be a better and more interesting place to work. And we hope to have that opportunity. The downside, of course, is without our involvement, the stock, we think, would be trading right back down to $97 a share. So we want to get your support so we can get on the board of the company. So how has ADP responded to us? And the answer is, you know what? Their response is, we're doing the best that we can, and it's good enough. And we don't think that's really the right answer. Uh, ADP put out a response on September 12th. And they basically said, you know, we're going to do the same. And they put out long-term projections for the first time. They're projecting that margins go from approximately 20% in the overall business to 21, 22 percent. Uh, that's 100, you know, one percentage point to two percentage points over three years. Again, paychecks overall margins at 39 percent in 2017. We think this gap is both unexplainable. Uh, you're unjustifiable. It's explainable by the inefficiency of the business. And we think management's goals here are very marginal and incremental. And the question you might ask is, why does management not see this opportunity? Why are they not incentivized to make this business more valuable? And here the incentives of management are interesting. ADP executives are incentivized to meet targeted goals. And the targets are set based on budgets. And the budgets compensate for management for meeting or you know, exceeding by a brief amount, a little amount, small amount, uh, the targets. And if they massively exceed the target, they don't make any more money. Uh, in fact, they make their life more difficult. So a CEO of this company makes about $10 million a year. 
A uh, chunk of that is in cash, maybe typically around a third if they make the target. And the balance is in restricted stock. These are grants of stock to the CEO and options. And the stock is granted and valued based on the stock price at the time. So if, in fact, management drove a lot of value in the short term, uh, they would certainly make their target for 2017. But then next year, they'd, we, their target would have to be off a much higher base. And they make their life more difficult. And so if the right way to incentivize management in a situation like this is to give all of their equity compensation up front at today's value and then give no compensation and tell them they're going to get no further equity compensation for the next five years. And that watch the difference in how management performs. Here the company and the management team are compensated for making incremental progress and punished if they do better, substantially better than expected because they make their life more difficult in year two where the budget will be based off growth off the higher uh, number. Um, next. Uh, You've received a letter probably from ADP in the mail, or a proxy card, and they have a white proxy card. And, and in their letter, they say, support us. Uh, our CEO has generated a 203% return since he became CEO of the company. Uh, now, 203% is a very good number over the last six years. The problem is it's, a, it's an incorrect number. And uh, you know, bad on management and the company for putting out a false number. Why is the number false? Well, number one, they start the calculation the day after. Uh, the CEO became CEO. And the day he became CEO, the stock dropped 3.9%. Well, they keep that day out of the calculation. They end the calculation on the day that rumors emerged of Pershing Square being in the stock. And the stock jumped to $111 a share and 50 cents or something like that. And they picked 12 PM on that day. And they said, that's the high point. Uh, the low point is you know, the day after he started. Uh, and that, of course, makes a huge uh, contribution to the you know, picking a lower starting point and a higher ending point, and you get to a much higher number. The other thing they do is they include the performance of CDK, uh, this business that was spun out of ADP, after it was no longer overseen by this management team. And that we find particularly egregious, because once that business was spun out and no longer managed by ADP, it did much better. And they include that performance in the calculation. And the right way to do the calculation, and the way the company does the calculation in its proximate statement it mails to you and its 10K, is they treat the spin-off as a dividend. They value it on the day it was spun off. And they take that dividend reinvested in ADP stock so that management is only compensated or judged based on the performance of the business that they control. Well, if you make those three adjustments, instead of earning a 203% return, they earn 141. The CEO and this management team earned 141% return over the past six years. That still sounds like a good number until you put it into context. And again, the judgment of a performance of a business is how it does relative to its competitors. Uh, what ADP does is they pick an unrelated or largely unrelated group of competitors. They say IBM is a competitor. They say Oracle, S&P, and Microsoft are competitors. And 91% of their competitor group includes those four companies. Well, that brings the number down because, again, this is a great industry. And if you look at the performance of the companies in the industry, the, co the companies in the industry have earned 186% return over the same period versus 141% to ADP. So 141% is quite good but not compared to the competition. And here they've underperformed by 45 percentage points. Um, so bottom line, they, didn't res they haven't responded. Uh, they've attacked us. Uh, one of their attacks, so they wrote you a letter recently, and they said Pershing Square lost money on Borders Group, Target Corporation, Valiant Pharmaceuticals, and JCPenney. That's true. We lost money on all four of those companies. But I've been in business for 14 years. And I think, as you know, in the investment business, you're going to make some mistakes. We certainly have our share, but four out of the you know, um, tens of companies that we've invested in over time where we've created enormous value for other shareholders. Again, I point you to the average 146% return on our activist uh, investments. Um, second, you know, with the companies underperforming and they, you know, they're, they're so far unwilling to do anything about it. And so we think it's either one of two things. Either they don't understand the opportunity or they're unwilling to take the steps necessary. And the way to fix that problem is make some changes uh, to the board. Next question is, can this be done without taking additional risk? And the answer is, of course, yes. And how do we know this? Well, we're fortunate here. We have some very good roadmaps for making ADP become more successful. A very good example uh, is to look at businesses that ADP has sold. ADP is a great company to buy companies from. So for example, Solera, which used to be called Claim Services, which was a business owned by ADP for many years, uh, was sold, renamed itself Solera. When it was owned by ADP, it had 18% margins. Uh, shortly after, four years after it was sold, it had 40% uh, margins, uh, five years after. Um, that's an enormous jump, and the buyer took advantage of ADP. 
And they did so without affecting customer relationships, without any harm to employees. They just made it a more profitable business, and everyone benefited. But there's a better example that I think perhaps many of you had the opportunity to participate in, and that a company was spun off to shareholders called CDK. It happened September of 2014. CDK was ADP's dealer services business. It was its largest subsidiary other than the core employer services business. They owned it for 42 years. And when it was owned by ADP, they said, look, the best we can do is increase margins a half a percent a year. You know, from, uh, and then they spun it off. And the same management team ran the business after the spinoff. Um, but they put in a new board of directors. Uh, the company went out into the public markets. A new group of shareholders bought stock in the company. One of them was a close uh, associate of mine, a former partner named Scott Ferguson. He bought 10% of the company. He sat down with the management and he said, look, there's a big opportunity here for improvement. Your competitors have meaningfully higher margins, almost more than twice the margins that you have, and we'd like you to take a close look at that issue. Very similar to the conversation I had with ADP when I first contacted uh, the CEO of the company. But instead of throwing him out of the room, instead of attacking me on TV, in this case, the CEO said, we're going to take a look at what you have to say. The board did an analysis. They hired a subsidiary of Price Waterhouse. They looked at the business. They looked at the organizational structure, the incentives. And they gave them some advice. And that they put together a plan. We're going to talk about that in some detail. And that has taken margins from 16% to 26% in three years, and now have a target to take margins to 35%. So two businesses in the last decade sold or spun off by ADP have done dramatically better afterwards. And by the way, the customers are happier, the employees are happier, and of course, the shareholders are happier. I'll try to pick up the pace because I want to finish in about 30 minutes. I've got about five minutes to go. Uh, this is the, the story of CDK as expressed in a stock price chart. It was spun off. It traded down to a low of 25. Uh, today, it's around $65 a share three years later. And again, the same management team was able to execute and fix the problem with just some changes uh, to the board of directors. So what was CDK's plan? And it's very instructive here. So when it was owned by ADP, they had three separate entities. And these quotes are quotes from management of CDK talking about what life was like at ADP. Once they uh, became a new, you know, decided to become an uh, efficient company, they simplified the structure and made it basically one entity. Uh, they had 1,500 software versions, 74 products. They're already down to 400, and that number is declining significantly. They had seven R&D organizations, and each of reporting to six different places in the organization, and they've gone to one global R&D organization. They had five sales teams. Today, they have one. They had 12 different, what they call old and clunky systems. Today, they have one. They had an overly cumbersome, lengthy product implementation process. This is the onboarding a customer. And now uh, they've been able to reduce implementation times by 30% through automation and other systems. And they're on a way to making it uh, better. Complexity. They, they talked about enormous legacy complexity. And what do they do? They reduce complexity. Uh, they had multiple organizations doing the same thing. They reduced the duplication uh, throughout the organization. And when it was owned by ADP, they said, look, we can achieve 0.4% or you know, 40 to 50 basis points or 0.4 to 0.5% of incremental margin progress over the next five years. And then in five years, they're projecting 20 percentage points, uh, you know, 40 times uh, what could be achieved while at ADP. OK. So uh, we think the opportunity here is relatively straightforward. It's most of what needs to be done here is basic blocking and tackling, running a business more effectively, precisely what's been done at CDK. So one, you know, restructure the organization, reduce its complexity, redesign the incentives, make it focus more on the clients uh, and less in the current uh, small, medium, large, uh, more product focused, more client focused. Um, reduce bureaucracy. Uh, ADP's got 12 layers, bring it down to five where Paychex is currently operating. Uh, consolidate the footprint of the real estate. Now this is an opportunity because they actually own approaching 40% or 4 million square feet of the 10 million square feet. Uh, my understanding is we haven't looked at each of these locations, but ADP like to locate in high traffic areas near highways. We think that real estate is going to have value. So it's a bit like ADP take, uh, at and taking up the copper wires, uh, putting down uh, fiber, and then selling the copper. You know, there is real value in the real estate footprint. Uh, restructuring the service organization to be more effective at providing uh, client support. Uh, improving implementation through automation, better technology, uh, investing intelligently to make the product easier uh, to use, and then you know, reduce the number of disparate platforms, uh, software programs, et cetera. And this, this approach 
uh, at CDK, it's rare you have an opportunity to see a business that came out of a company and, and the approach they took and what could be applied at the parent company. So we think that's what's needed here. Um, next. Okay. Um, beyond just efficiency, we think there's an opportunity to meaningfully improve the growth of the company. And that becomes, as you become a more effective and a more efficient company, as you change the incentives, you can increase and accelerate the growth. Uh, accelerating top line growth plus margin improvement, that leads to a much more profitable uh, business. And you see that here, if you take ADP's plan and you follow their projections, you get to a company earning something approaching $6 a share in fiscal year 2022. That number becomes approaching $9 a share, about 50% higher if you just run a more efficient business that enables a faster growing company. And the benefit to shareholders beyond stock price appreciation, if this is a great business, it requires very little capital. So as earnings grow, cash flow grows, and the company can return more of that cash flow in the form of dividends and stock buybacks uh, to shareholders. So who are the people uh, that we are proposing to this board? Uh, they are myself, uh, the CEO of Pershing Square, uh, a, a woman by the name of uh, Ronnie Hagen, who we're going to talk to you about a little bit, uh, and a guy by the name of Paul Unruh. Uh, both very experienced executives who have a lot of experience in taking out efficiency, uh, uh, taking, creating efficiency, taking costs out, and reforming and restructuring uh, businesses. If you vote for the management slate, uh, you're basically saying, I'm happy with the status quo. I don't want to see any changes. This is the best they can do, uh, and there's really no reason or to, to do any better. In our case, you bring in fresh perspectives. We're opposing three directors on the board that have been there for a decade or more, bringing in people who have a fresh uh, perspective, who have a focus on business transformation, and a focus on accelerating and improving uh, the company. Um, important things, we are not seeking control of ADP. Uh, if all three of our directors are elected to the board, they'll represent three of 10 directors, the full board will make any decision. So a substantial majority, 70 plus percent of the board, will be incumbent directors. And we like this because we think there are a lot of very good directors on this board, inclu including some recent additions that have excellent expertise in technology, an area where the company's been somewhat deficient. Uh, we have no plans to change the dividend policy of the company. The company's distributing about 55% of its earnings. Again, as earnings grow, those dividends will grow more quickly. Uh, we don't plan to have no plans to change the company's investment policy. This is in the investment of the company's float. We think it's critically important the float is invested extremely safely. We would not change that. We don't think it's prudent to change the company's uh, credit rating or its balance sheet. Uh, we don't want ADP to take risk. Why? Because we're a major shareholder of the company. We've got tw more than 25% of our capital, excuse me, invested in ADP, and uh, it's not necessary in order to create a lot of value. Um, so it's beyond just electing representatives, proxy contests are about sending a message uh, to the board of directors. Uh, and the way to do that is, uh, particularly when a company fights back hard, and we've had other cases, I'll talk to you about a couple of them, where, where companies have fought back hard against us, when we're still elected by shareholders, that gives us a mandate for change in the boardroom. The board wakes up and says, okay, our shareholders are supportive of these directors, and the board works together and does what's in the best interest uh, of the owners of the business. So let me walk you through uh, the other two candidates. I'll make a few comments on myself if I can. I have uh, one board seat today. I'm chair of the board of the Howard Hughes Corporation. I've been a chairman of that board uh, for now almost uh, seven years. Uh, the company has uh, achieved a 217% uh, total shareholder return, so about a 3.2x uh, multiple since it became a public company in November of 2010. Uh, it's a real estate company, um, but I certainly have a substantial amount of board experience having served on multiple boards over the last uh, 25 years of my career. I'm also not new. Again, we've made many investments where it was the first time we invested in a railroad, the first time we invested in a pharmaceutical, you know, uh, animal pharmaceutical company, first time we invested in industrial gas business. Here, it's not the first time we've been an investor. We've been an investor since 2006 in this industry. Uh, our, our initial investment in the industry was in a company called Ceridian, which continues to uh, exist today as a privately held company by the owned by private equity. Uh, we owned about a 15, 16% stake in the business. We were directors of that company. That company got sold uh, to Thomas H. Lee, who continues to own that business uh, today. We were also an investor in ADP. We bought ADP stock when the company was coming out of the recession. We were a passive investor at that time. Uh, so this is an industry we've followed for a significant period of time. And of course, we are major owners 
uh, of the company, uh, one of the largest owners, uh, you know, $2.6 billion investment. Uh, next, Veronica Hagen, or Ronnie as she likes to be called. Uh, Ronnie is formerly the CEO of a company called Polymer Group. Uh, this is a business that is a relatively low margin business. Um, and when you run a low margin business, one of the things you learn how to do is keep your costs under control. Uh, Ronnie was a very successful CEO. Her company was acquired by Blackstone, a, a very good private equity firm. They kept her on as CEO. Uh, she ran that business for Blackstone. They made more than three times their money uh, with Ronnie as CEO. Uh, she has a lot of experience as a director of large public companies. Uh, she was the lead director of the Southern Company. I think she continues to sit on that board. So multiple board experiences, uh, very talented CEO with a real focus on cost control. And then Paul Unruh. Uh, Paul, former vice chairman at Bechtel. He comes from an accountancy uh, background, joined Bechtel as a treasurer, and then CFO, and eventually vice chairman of that company, you know, part of a three-person C-suite that oversaw that business. Obviously, as a CFO, uh, he, uh, he certainly understood the payroll uh, business, helped implement, take, uh, implement uh, various human capital management systems at Bechtel over the years. What we bring him, the reason why we have him on our slate here beyond his uh, business expertise, uh, his board experience, is a recent experience he had at Symantec. This is a largely a business uh, software company, or thus some consumer software uh, business as well. He was part of a program where, where the board did precisely uh, what we're asking this board to do, is take a look at the whole organizational structure, the overall efficiency of the business, uh, how can we improve things. Uh, the board formed a subcommittee, the board hired uh, that subcommittee hired a consultant, worked with management and the board, uh, and they identified $400 million of costs uh, that they could take out. Now, notably, uh, Ronnie and Paul, of their own initiative, said, you know, Bill, we'd like to invest in uh, ADP because we want to be part of the uh, uh, story. Uh, we, you know, we like to put our money where our mouth is. We don't, you know, we're not looking for board seats simply to correct, collect director's fees. They both invested more than $300,000 in the stock of their own money. Uh, so we have three candidates, each of whom have significant investments of their net worth invested alongside uh, shareholders. The directors we seek to replace are uh, the current chairman, John Jones. Um, again, these are all good people. This is not a uh, personality contest. It's not, there's no question about character. Uh, this is really a question. A director has been on the board now for 12 years, uh, 12 years during a period where the company has massively underachieved its potential. Uh, this is an executive who ran a company called Air Products, which we're very familiar with. And in fact, we were a large active investor in Air Products. And what created the opportunity for our investment is the business was undermanaged. Uh, the business underachieved its potential. The margins declined under Mr. Jones's uh, chairman and CEO uh, uh, leadership. Uh, the executive he put in to run the business uh, was not successful. Uh, that caused the stock to underperform its competitors. We bought a large stake in the business, about 9.8%. Uh, they were open to working with us. They were open to listening to our ideas. Uh, Mr. Jones was gone at that point in time. And we put uh, three new directors on that board, two of which we identified, one of which the company identified, who we thought was an excellent candidate. And we put a director on that we thought could add a lot of value knowing the industry uh, quite well. Uh, the CEO then chose to retire. Uh, and then our candidate, Sefi Kasemi, became CEO of the business. That was three years ago. The stock is up about 100%, including dividends and the spin-off of a specialty chemical business uh, since that period. Um, so well, Mr. Jones, I'm sure, is a, a terrific guy. I don't know him well. He's been there a long time, and we think is not a, has, does not have a particular interest in margin expansion based on his own career experience. Uh, Glenn Hubbard, who we've matched up against Ronnie Hagen, I know him well. He's dean of Columbia Business School. He's a thoughtful economist. Um, and I think he's a very good business school dean. But he not, does not have the experience running a business to create efficiency. He's on many boards. I think the number totals uh, well over 80. These are many mutual fund boards. He's on the boards of a number of public companies. He's on uh, private company boards. He's on uh, foundation or, or not-for-profit boards. You know, it's a very active person. It's not clear to me how much time he has to devote this, to this situation. And he's been there. He's the longest standing director at 13 years. Uh, to his credit, he bought 1,000 shares about 13 years ago. To the discredit of the other directors, Mr. Jones, who's a wealthy man, hasn't bought one share of ADP uh, stock. Lastly, Eric Fast uh, is chair of the audit committee. Again, been there a long time. It's been more than 10 years. And we think Paul, with fresh perspectives, a willingness to invest his own capital, uh, also chair of the audit committee. Uh, so he brings the relevant accounting expertise uh, to, to this board. Um, just mentioned briefly three companies 
where we did something quite similar to ADP. These are the only three investments we've made to date. We were focused on improving the operational efficiency of a business. One was Canadian Pacific. We had a fairly similar response to ADP. They fought quite hard not to keep us on the board. We won a proxy contest. We elected seven directors to the board. Uh, we told shareholders we could take margins from 19% to 35%. They're now over 39%. And the stock has increased 4.3 times during our uh, ownership of the business. And it's become one of the best run railroads in North America from the worst run railroad in North America. Air products I mentioned before, uh, we projected margins of 20% four years out. Uh, Sefi Gassemi, the CEO, has done a fabulous job. He's already at 22% margins. Uh, it's been a very attractive return uh, over our investment period. And then Zoetis, an animal health company, uh, again, the board said, you know, we welcome you. We put two directors on that board. Uh, they've expanded margins, uh, you know, in excess of what we projected at the time. Shareholders have earned a very attractive return. Uh, three different situations. Two of the three, the board said, you know what, we don't want to fight. We're open to working with you. You're a major investor in the company. We're interested in hearing your point of view. What's the downside to inviting you to join the board? And that is the response we expected from ADP, but we were unfortunately a little disappointed. So what do we add? You add a major shareholder if you support us, fresh perspectives, expertise in business transformation, and operational efficiency. We've got skin in the game as major uh, investors in the company, but we're only going to be three of 10 if all three of our directors are elected. Only one of the directors is affiliated with Pershing Square. I had no previous relationship uh, with Ronnie or Paul before they got involved in this situation. Uh, we actually hired a headhunter that helped us find them. We were looking for specific skills that, that we thought they brought uh, to the table. You know, importantly, because we're only three of 10, we're not going to run around and make big changes to the company, but we're not afraid to share ideas and input and work with the other directors. And I had an opportunity to meet with the full board on September 5th. And this is a board I could work very effectively with. I think we just need to put the proxy contest behind us. A lot of very thoughtful, smart people who bring value, uh, who will remain on the board. A couple of other important points. Um, individual investors, typically, their response to receiving a proxy in the mail is to throw it out. But I would say that the decision to vote your shares here is as important as the decision to vote for the President of the United States, to vote for a senator or a congressman to represent you. Uh, this is, your vote is very important. And you don't think of your vote as being important because you might own 100 shares and the company you know, may have hundreds of millions of shares. Um, and uh, most people uh, in a situation like that, uh, they just don't have the time to read the materials. And so what we've tried to do here is lay things out in a relatively straightforward way. And the in individual investors, the retail community here owns 28% of the company. That's by far, if you think about the retail community as one investor, the biggest investor in the company. It's your company. You get to decide. Now, how do you vote? Um, you have a choice. If you, want, if, you're, if you want the status quo, you vote for management. If you want change, relevant expertise on the board, a major shareholder, you vote the gold proxy. And you're going to get a few proxies. I hate to mail out. Lots of materials. It's not great for the environment, but it's a necessary evil of a proxy contest. You'll get three or four letters from us. Only your latest dated proxy uh, counts. So if you've already, someone uh, accidentally voted the white card and you, what you hear today makes sense to you, uh, you can vote one of our gold proxy cards. Uh, let me explain to you how that's done. Watch this little video. ADP shareholders face a critical choice this fall, and it's important to make your voice heard. Vote Gold to ensure that the company and all shareholders have the right board of directors in place to oversee ADP as it undertakes a necessary transformation to strengthen and grow its business. Voting is easy, and every vote counts. Here's how it works. If you're a registered shareholder, you'll receive a Gold Proxy card. If you hold ADP shares through a bank or brokerage account, you'll receive a gold voting instruction form. For each account holding ADP shares, you will receive additional gold proxy cards or instruction forms. To support Pershing Square's nominees for ADP's transformation, you need to vote every gold proxy card or gold voting instruction form that you receive. To vote by mail, check for all nominees and sign date, and return your gold proxy card or voting instruction form in the postage paid envelope provided. To vote by phone, dial the toll-free number on your gold proxy card or instruction form and follow the simple instructions when prompted. 
To vote online, registered shareholders go to www.fcrvote.com slash ADP. Enter the unique 12-digit control number on your gold proxy card. Select for all nominees. Make your selections on other items up for vote and click Submit. If you've received a gold voting instruction form for shares held through a bank or brokerage account, go to www.proxyvote.com, enter your unique 16-digit control number, select for all nominees, make your other selections, and click Submit. Disregard the white proxy cards or voting instruction forms sent to you by ADP. Recycle them as soon as you get them. If you previously voted a white proxy card or voting instruction form, don't be concerned. Simply vote a later dated gold proxy card or voting instruction form to change your vote. Remember, only your latest dated vote counts. So be sure to vote every gold proxy card or voting instruction form that you receive. Make your voice heard. So on the chance you didn't receive a proxy card in the mail, you can call DF King at 866-342-1635 and they will send you a proxy card that you can vote. Now we're going to go to Q&A. If you want to identify yourself, I'll, uh, I'll shout you out in terms of who you are, where you're from, how many shares you own. You can certainly free to ask an anonymous question uh, if you'd like. If you have questions, please send them to adpascending at persq.com. So I've got a question, Jerry from Toronto. In the case of ADP, it appears that change is needed for the company to maximize its potential and valuation. Can you please discuss the role Pershing Square Capital Management intends to play in effectuating cultural and operational change at ADP? Please also discuss whether other investments where Pershing Square has worked with the board and management to bring significant change. Now, a lot of this question, and you can just roll it back so I can see the whole question, please, um, is uh, we, I've done my best to answer with some other examples. But the role we intend to play here is I will be, if I'm elected to the board, one of 10 directors. And I'm going to uh, work with the other directors to identify the issues and solve the problems uh, that exist here. And those, uh, the first thing that we would recommend to the board is to hire a consultant to look at the organizational structure and the cost opportunity uh, at ADP. Uh, I probably would certainly take a look at the same consultant that did the work at CDK, because I think they've done an excellent job. And there is some learning from that. Uh, experience. Um, you know, I think just the proxy contest itself is going to have a dramatic effect on ADP if we're elected, because it will send a message that there's a, a sort of a new game, uh, a new, new opportunity for the company to take a fresh look at everything uh, that it's doing. Okay, um, next question, please. Uh, if there's such a big opportunity here, why has ADP's management failed to recognize it? Are they incompetent? And the answer is we don't think they're incompetent. This is anonymous from New Jersey. Um, but uh, the, the answer is that management has never been incentivized. This is a company that has been known for generating incremental performance over many years. It's a company that met its earnings, increased its dividend on a regular basis for a very long period of time, and no one took a deeper look. And if you become CEO of this business, I, I almost describe it a bit like inheriting a trust fund. You know, you don't want to screw it up. And making significant changes or doing things differently from the way you've done them in the past, that might be something that is, is difficult uh, for you to do without the backing of a major owner. And you know, boards can be, you know, when they don't own a lot of stock, their biggest fear is liability as opposed to focusing on what's in the best interests of shareholders. So I think there's a lot of very competent, very talented people here that just need to be inspired uh, into a new direction. And I think the board plays a very significant role in that regard. Next. Another anonymous question from New Jersey. <clears throat> I'm an ADP employee. I'd like to vote for you. Is voting confidential? Uh, the answer is voting is confidential, and you should feel free to cast your vote, just like you vote for whatever presidential candidate you want, and you, no one needs to know which way you voted. Next question. Uh, Rob from Louisville. What would be your approach to dividend policy for ADP? So our plan would be to keep the same dividend policy the company has today. Uh, the company distributes about 55% or so of its earnings in the form of a, a dividend. Uh, and you know this is a business that generates a lot of free cash flow. There isn't a significant amount of capital required for investment. In fact, we think the company will free up a lot of capital if it's run uh, more efficiently. Part of that will come from selling off a lot of real estate uh, around the country. 
that money can be returned to shareholders either in the form of dividends or in the form of repurchasing shares. I mean, the, the right way for a company to think about dividend policy or return of capital in the form of a buyback is first to look at are there opportunities inside the company to make investments that will accelerate the growth of the business where the company can earn attractive returns on that capital. That's the first place to look for capital. If you don't have those opportunities and you don't foresee them in the future, then the right thing to do is to return that money to shareholders on a regular basis with dividends or in the form of share repurchases. And one of the things that we've uh, suggested is ADP has an issue in their national account business. And we don't think the company's adequately explored, explored whether there's a, competitive, a competitor that might make sense to acquire to address that problem. That would be, a, we think, a good potential use of capital. We'd have to look at with what the status of the company's product is that they're developing, how it competes with what's, you know, com how competitive it is with what's out there in the marketplace. But these are the kind of decisions that a board thinks about in deciding how do we deploy our money. But the basic answer is we're going to keep things largely the same. You know, I think their distribution policy is reasonable. Uh, and if we can help the company accelerate earnings growth, your dividends will grow even faster. A uh, question from Brett from North Wales. What would be the expected rate of growth of the dividend of your plan uh, were to be implemented successfully? Uh, we expect earnings to grow uh, at about a 20% or so compounded rate. You can expect the dividend to grow at a similar rate uh, over that period with earnings. Uh, Marcelo uh, from Sydney, uh, there's clearly a lot of work to be done. Do you think that adding three new people to the board is sufficient? Um, there seems to be a huge amount of work required. Is this something that the current management team is up to? The answer is we think uh, the most important thing about a proxy contest is for shareholders to give us a mandate and get, to help make this business be more successful. The stronger the mandate, uh, the more successful we can be. In the case of Canadian Pacific, our seven directors, all seven were elected. We got approximately 90% of the vote. The directors we opposed got less than five or 6% of the vote. It was an incredibly powerful uh, way to send a message to the board that shareholders were unhappy with the status quo and they wanted change. So the more powerful the message, the greater percentage of the votes we receive, the greater the number of our candidates that get on the board, the more successful uh, that we can be. Um, I do think three is enough. Why? Because I think the other directors uh, you know, lot that we're leaving on the board we think are excellent and we think they bring value uh, to the table. There isn't a need to change more than three directors. Is this something the current management team is up to? You know, this I don't yet know today. I really have not had an opportunity to spend time with the management of the company. Um, and you know, we have seen examples. A good example is our investment in Zoetis. Uh, Zoetis was, uh, was and continues to be run by an executive by the name of Juan Ramon Alix. Uh, I met with Juan Ramon uh, when the company was uh, spun off. We bought a large stake. It was spun out of Pfizer. We bought a large stake. It's again, another New Jersey-based company. We bought a significant stake in the business. We sat down with management. We shared with them what we viewed the opportunity for change would be, and they bought into it, and they were excited about it. And uh, they brought on the necessary advice and consultants to help them. Uh, and we added two directors to the board who could help oversee the process, and we've worked very successfully with management. And I didn't know going in whether Juan Ramon was up to the challenge or excited about the challenge uh, or was capable of executing. Uh, but we spent sufficient time with management, we got comfortable. And I think the same thing is possible here. Uh, the other possibility is that management isn't up to the challenge. And this is a decision the full board will make when the facts are heard. But I think there are a lot of very capable people here. And if, they, you know, if what they say after you know, we identify a large opportunity and that's confirmed by outside consultants, they say, look, this is not something I want to buy into. I'd have to change out members of my team that I'm loyal to, that I've worked with for 20 years. Uh, sometimes the CEO, like in the case of Air Products, says, you know, this is not for me. I'm, pretty, I'm prepared to hand the reins to someone else. Uh, so it depends. We don't yet know the answer to that. But we're open, I think importantly, to either. Uh, question, Michael from Tampa Bay. If you can roll the question for me. The company's culture seems to be resistant to change. How do you change this and implement a new culture from the top down? Uh, the answer is we don't know enough where the resistance is coming from. You know, today I would say the resistance is clearly coming from the board of directors in the company based on how the company has responded to us. What I can also tell you is we're getting a lot of inbound calls from shareholders and we're getting a lot of inbound calls from employees of the company. Uh, questions like, can, you know, can I vote with you, <laughs> I vote for you anonymously? Uh, questions like, um, you know, one of the, our CFO was at a soccer game, lives in New Jersey. 
His two sons are playing in the game. They're chatting. Oh, which company do you work for? This person says, oh, I work at ADP. He asked my CFO, or actually now my president, which, which company do you work for? And he said, oh, I work for Pershing Square. Uh, and they had kind of a laugh over that. And this executive said, you know, you're totally right, but that's off the record. So I'm not going to identify who he is, but I do think there's a feeling inside ADP that change needs to happen at the company. A good example of how we know that is there's a website. You should go take a look at it yourself. It's called Glassdoor. If you go to Glassdoor, it's a site where employees rank the management teams and comment on. It's a bit of a review site for companies on the management team and the business and how you feel about the company. ADP has the lowest rankings of its nine other uh, competitors uh, in each of these various regards. So there clearly is a lot of discontent in the company about, my guess is, some of the things that we're talking about uh, here. OK, next question. Um, Robert from Diamond Bar, California. If your ideas are so great, and since you've shared them freely with everyone, why wouldn't ADP just implement them without you being on the board and staging this proxy contest? Um, the answer is, that's a good question for them. Um, what they've made very clear is that you know, they've given it now, for the first time, a three-year projection, projecting 100 to 200 basis point uh, improvement. Uh, and that's what they're saying the best they can do is. Um, and I think an alternative question is, What's the downside to putting a major owner in the boardroom who's had experience with these kind of operational, uh, operational change at large companies, who's created a lot of value for shareholders? Uh, what's wrong with giving that person one seat on the board? What's wrong with bringing in you know, a couple of executives who have a lot of experience in running businesses efficiently? The, the piece that's missing on the board of directors is ownership. There is not a shareholder ownership culture on the board. The other piece that's missing is efficiency experts and people who have run large, efficient businesses and extracted significant costs from them. You know, those pieces are missing on this board. Next, please. Next question. Kenneth from Huntington, Indiana. What impact would the Pershing Square streamline of ADP have on headcount? Hiring freeze, could you advise? So one of the things we're sensitive to is we don't like making investments where there's a human cost associated with them. And I think what's important here is, number one, the good news is this is a growing business with significant secular tailwinds. And Paychex made a lot of progress from an efficiency point of view, but they got there not by firing lots of people. They got there by growing into a more efficient organization. The second thing is there's a, lot of, a fair amount of turnover at ADP. Something like 11% of the people leave each year. So just with the passage of time, you can become a more efficient organization. And if you make it a more dynamic and interesting place, the people who stay are going to be the better and more qualified uh, people. The you know, last point I would make um, is that uh, the good news is uh, that uh, you know, we're in a, a very strong economy. Uh, ADP has a lot of employees who have been there for a very long period of time. So if the decision is made, you know what, we, we want to shrink various groups at the company, you know, we, the company can offer early retirement programs. and. That's basically what happened uh, at Canadian Pacific. There wasn't, you know, the company was not impacted by you know, large-scale layoffs. Uh, they had a lot of long-tenured executives. And just the demographics of the workforce, the passage of time, some incentives for early retirement, were able to minimize any human cost. And we would you know, be very supportive of the same thing here. Next question. I don't see a next question. Uh, there's nothing on the screen. And here we go. Uh, we got Rachel from Charlottesville. ADP stock has been strong. Many question the value that you can actually extract from such a long established company, particularly looking at the proposed 1,200 basis point margin expansion. How do you propose doing this without significant sacrifice in certain areas of the company? So again, what I've tried to do in the presentation is show you how this has been accomplished at businesses very analogous to ADP run by management teams that used to be under this board's oversight. Uh, the moment they were spun out, all of a sudden they had a huge opportunity for improvement. ADP needs to pretend like it's a spin-off. Uh, take out a blank sheet of paper. How should the organization be structured? How should we incentivize the team? What's the right number of people to have in a group to accomplish the objectives that we want to accomplish? How can we modify our uh, software to make it easier to use so we don't need as many people providing you know, product support, and in fact, we can provide high-level uh, support. If you can show me the next question, please. Um, the screen is blank. Uh, yes, uh, we've got two questions left. Uh, we've got Steve uh, from Toronto. How long before the impact will be seen in the company? The good news is the impact can happen quite quickly. Taking costs out of a very inefficient company 
Uh, it's a great way to show profit uh, productivity very, very quickly. Uh, and, the same, and if you saw, if you just take a look at the stock price chart uh, in the deck, which you can print up at home, where you pull up stock price chart for CDK, it's almost a straight line up over the last three years. As shareholders began rec recognizing the opportunity for profit, as the company announced much better earnings than expected as they implemented. Next question, please. Got Kieran from Charleston. Why do you think the management has been so hostile to you having a board seat? Does that indicate a need for change? The answer is yes. The more a company fights back to keep a major shareholder off the board, the more insular the culture, the more necessary it is to have disparate points of view uh, in the boardroom. So it's, what's interesting is you can tell by the company's response to us uh, that change is needed here. So it's an excellent question. Next question, please. Still waiting for the next question. Yes, uh, this is from Sue. Uh, given the challenges of the proxy contest, how open will the board be to recommended changes? Uh, the answer is uh, the Canadian Pacific proxy contest was one of the most fiercely fought proxy contests in the history of proxy contests. Uh, Canadian Pacific is a very proud Canadian company. Uh, we were a New York, US based. Uh, institution. I think they viewed it almost like a, they described it almost like a hostile takeover of, of a Canadian company by American uh, executives. And uh, they fought really hard. Um, the good news is, one, it wasn't the way they characterized it. Perhaps that's the way they felt about it emotionally. But we joined the board of directors. Uh, and, you know, after a good first 20 minutes of the uh, board meeting, after the, we had a meeting right after the uh, uh, the vote was uh, counted. There were some sore feelings in the room, but very quickly the board said, you know what, the shareholders have spoken. They've told us what they want, and we're going to work to deliver what they want. And we actually got a number of directors apologized to us and said, you know, we, they didn't realize what was really going on, that the chairman had really led the proxy contest and hadn't kept them fully informed, and that they were excited to work with us. And you know, we had a very smooth experience. I was on the board of that company uh, for five years, uh, four and a half years, and uh, the stock did well, uh, employees did well. When we would go around meeting with you know, uh, members, you know, people who worked on the railroad, we would go to various uh, you know, sites at the company, people would come up to me and, and thank me, uh, employees, for the new home they bought or the uh, you know, the positive impact that uh, we had on the company. And we hope to have the same opportunity at ADP. I'm being told we have no more questions. Uh, magically, it's actually almost exactly an hour. Uh, we're known for somewhat long presentations, so maybe I'll close it off here at uh, an hour. So let me just remind you, uh, we've got a lot of information on our website, uh, adpascending.com. Uh, you can ask us questions. Again, send them to adpascending at persq.com. Feel free to give me a call. You can call me at 212-813-3700. Your, vo your vote is extremely important here. 28% of the stock is held by the individual investor, and this is an opportunity for you uh, to act like an owner and do what's in the best interest of the business. We very much appreciate your support. Please vote the gold card. Thank you very much.